So uh, hi and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Binger and I'm um, one of the two curators of this festival. I've curated together with um, Florian Wist. And uh, when me and Florian uh, first uh, uh, started to uh, curate the festival, started to think about the festival, we, uh, we uh, had the possibility to, to commission uh, a few artists. And the first name that came up to both of us simultaneously was actually the person who's sitting uh, next to me here, Zachary Formwalt, and um, we were extremely happy that he wanted to do a work specifically for the Impact Festival, uh, the work that you can see in the exhibition called uh, An Industry and Its Irreplaceable Medium um, at the Impact Center. And um, we, in, in the festival we have decided to uh, have each panel that is presented in the festival um, takes off from a particular artwork that is presented elsewhere in the festival, in the screening program or in the exhibition. So uh, this particular panel then, in the form of all the substances, uh, starts off from, from Zachary's work. And um, um, I also would like to suggest that after this panel there is um, uh, a screening program called Animal, the, the Animal Paradox, and uh, this has also been inspired by uh, Zachary's work in part. Uh, Zachary Formwalt lives and works in Amsterdam. He has presented solo projects in many venues around the world, including the Museum of Contemporary Art, Busan, Academy, Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and Kunsthalle Basel. His essays have appeared in various journals, including Grey Room, Open, Grey Room, Open Kunstlicht, and Metropolis, M. He, te he teaches theory at the Graphic Design Department of uh, the Gerd Rittveld Academy in Amsterdam. Sa uh, Salome Aguilera Skwierski, uh, she, is the, she is an associate professor of media studies uh, at the University of Chicago. She is the author of The Process Genre, uh, Cinema and the Aesthetic of Labor. And Lee Claire Berg is an associate professor of English at the University of New York. She is the author of Wages Against Artwork, uh, decommodified de 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 labor, and the claims of socially engaged art, and is currently working on a book called Marks for Cats, a radical bestiary. Uh, uh, both both uh, Salome and Leclerc uh, are uh, on fellowships at the Freie Universität Berlin now, which also makes it possible for them to be here today without traveling by plane. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, so just quickly about format. Um, each of us have prepared uh, 10 to 12 minute kind of uh, statements, remarks, um, so that we get to the points that we hope to get to. Uh, and then we're gonna discuss a little bit after that. And um, in the last 15 minutes, we'll uh, open it up for questions from the audience. So if you've seen the exhibition, you will recognize the video here from the film loop installed in the space. On the label for the work, the medium is described as the following. Installation with moving image of Chicago's bubbly creek, suspended in thin layers of rendered cattle remains, spread over the surface of 100 meters of flexible polyester film, passing through a 16 millimeter film projector on a looping platter. I felt this was a more accurate description of the materials than 16 millimeter film loop, which would have been the standard description. 
Probably the most famous description of Chicago's bubbly creek comes from Upton Sinclair's 1906 novel, The Jungle. This is a quote. Bubbly Creek is an arm of the Chicago River and forms the southern boundary of the Union stockyards. All the drainage of the square mile of packing houses empties into it so that it is really a great open sewer. A hundred or yeah, a great open sewer, a hundred or two feet wide. One long arm of it is blind, and the filth stays there forever and a day. The grease and chemicals that are poured into it undergo all sorts of strange transformations, which are the cause of its name. It is constantly in motion as if huge fish were feeding in it, or great leviathans disporting themselves in its depths. Bubbles of carbonic acid gas, or sorry, bubbles of carbonic gas, will rise to the surface and burst and make rings two or three feet wide. Here and there, the grease and filth have caked solid, and the creek looks like a bed of lava. Chickens walk about on it, feeding, and many times an unwary stranger has started to stroll across and vanished temporarily. The packers used to leave the creek that way, till every now and then the surface would catch on fire and burn furiously, and the fire department would have to come out and put it out. Once, however, an ingenious stranger came and started to gather this filth in scows to make lard out of it. Then the packers took the cue and got out an injunction to stop them, to stop him, and afterwards gathered it themselves. The banks of Bubbly Creek are plastered thick with hairs, and this also the packers gather and clean. So as you can see, the creek has changed since then. But if you look closely, you'll see small bubbles which break the surface now and then, particularly when the wind stops blowing it. But you can even see it in some of these parts too. These bubbles carry the same gases from the decomposition of animal remains as the large bubbles described in 1906. These bubbles are, in a sense, another form of the animal that once stood in the stockyards over a century ago before being transformed into an immense, a monstrous collection of commodities. It is with a monstrous collection of commodities that Karl Marx begins the first volume of Capital. This is how wealth appears in capitalist societies, as a monstrous collection of commodities. The title of this panel is also drawn from Marx, though not from Capital. In the Grünrisse, Marx's preparatory notebooks for capital, composed in the decade before the Chicago stockyards were established. He describes capital as money in the form of all substances. In doing the research for this project, I began to realize that industrially produced animals have a strong relation, if not a direct identification, with money in this formula. That capital might also be described as animals at least animals that were at some point livestock, in the form of all substances. It is nearly impossible to ensure that any commodity we come into contact with has not itself, at some point in the process of its production, involved the remains of industrially processed animals. This whole project started for me last October, when I received an email from Salome, Lee Claire, and Seth Kim Cohen, who couldn't be here today asked if I would be interested in making a film that would be presented as part of a Mellon Fellowship they had with the Gray Center for the Arts and Inquiry at the University of Chicago, where they had held an, inter an interdisciplinary graduate course in 2021 called Economic Objects, Capitalism as Medium, that was exploring art practices that engage in one way or another with economic issues as something more than mere content. This is coming from their description of it. I had been a visiting artist in one of their sessions in the spring, and that was how we first met. From the email I received last October, <laughs> our idea is to offer you a commission to explore the many residues and histories between animal industry and capitalist history or visuality 
in Chicago as those problems linked to the industrial in, to the industrial and monopoly accumulation of the 20th century, as well as the financial accumulation in our own time. I'd love to do this, was my reply. And so it began. The research was pretty sprawling at first. There were two key references that Lee Claire, Salome, and Seth had given. Alex Blanchett's book, Porkopolis, American Animality, Standardized Life in the Factory Farm, and Nicole Shukin's Animal Capital, Rendering Life in Biopolitical Times. And then I was reading William Cronin's Nature's Metropolis, Chicago and the Great West. And I was thinking of Bertolt Brecht's play, St. Joan of the Stockyards, which is set in Chicago's meatpacking meat district in the early 1930s. I ended up finding a site in this district which would come to be the central setting for the film. An abandoned building recently stabilized to prevent its collapse that was once ser that once served as the National Stockyard Bank, in the basement of which were a series of vaults that had been unused since the meatpacking industry largely left the city of Chicago in the late 1960s. The stockyards, where animals were held before slaughter, were the iconic figure of the meatpacking industry's presence in the city since the mid-19th century, up until the 1960s when that industry began to move elsewhere and this bank was situated right in the middle of them. The selection of this site would pose problems, both practical in terms of physically accessing the site, and theoretical in terms of what it meant to make a work dealing with the animal industry and industrial meatpacking, in which no animals appear in forms that we would recognize. What appears in the video instead are the surfaces of one of the meatpacking industry's ruins. But these ruins never came into physical contact with pigs, cows, or sheep, even when they were operating at full force. Because what these surfaces had contained when still in use was not the animals themselves, but the money that the large meatpacking companies would exchange for the animals. The cash they would pay out to those bringing the animals to Chicago stockyards. Millions of dollars each day were exchanged for these animals. So on the one hand, there is this site where the money that would be transformed into animals that would themselves be transformed into hundreds of different commodities was held. On the other hand, the video begins and ends with a body of water that lies nearby the stockyard, the one you see here, Bubbly Creek. In the exhibition, the surface of this creek appears in another form as well. While it begins and ends the video essay projected on one side of a screen suspended in the space, on the other side, it is continuously projected on a 16 millimeter film loop. Film, it turns out, was one of those products that made use of some of those remains that would have once been dumped into this water by the meatpacking industry. So in, the, so in the exhibition, what you see is a moving image of Chicago's bubbly creek suspended in thin layers of rendered cattle, cattle remains spread over the surface of 100 meters of flexible polyester film passing through a 16 millimeter projector on a looping platter. That's my introduction. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Lee Claire. Um, well, thank you um, for that. And also just, um, I wanna thank the, the organizers and the curators for inviting us because um, it really is such a, a pleasure uh, to be in Europe for the year and to get to travel to different places and, and meet people. So I'll be very excited to talk to people after our panel as well. Um, to me, uh, this film is a film about the relationship between capitalism and animals, about what this economic system asks of non-human actors, which is a lot. First it demands their life and then it demands their death. The film, of course, takes us from a river, the creek, to a vault, and then finally into our own uh, present. And I see this film as being suspended between two moments of what the scholar Nicole Shukin calls animal capital. We have the early 20th century moment of the industrialization of the animal, and then we have the late 20th, early 21st century moment of the deindustrialization of the animal. But like most deindustrialization, uh, the industry doesn't disappear, doesn't really deindustrialize. Um, rather, it's transformed, it's placed elsewhere, it's redistributed. Um, but after all, people still eat 
meat and make use of animal commodities. So I want to start today in the 19th century, which I think really haunts um, Zachary's film. And this is a moment where the American Midwest, which is of course uh, the, the, the area of the country of which Chicago was the, the central metropolis, um, where the American Midwest is being reshaped by railroads. But those railroads themselves follow the course of cattle and pig operations. And Chicago forms a kind of star to connect a railroad infrastructure with pastures, feedlots, and markets all over the Midwest. And this information that I'm giving you right now comes from a wonderful new book by Joshua Specht called Red Meat Republic, um, which really locates industrial animal agriculture at the center of the indigenous expulsion the land changes, the urban forms, and the industrialization of the American Midwest in the 19th century. This book itself could be read as a sequel uh, to Victoria de John's book of 2004, I believe, called Creatures of Empire, on how similar animals, mostly cattle, um, were used in New England in the 17th century also to expropriate indigenous lands. And signs used to appear, appear all over New England that said, um, cows in, Indians out. So fences and partitions that could organize livestock in a certain way, but they could also expel indigenous people. By the time a company like Swift and Co., which is a sort of central star, I think, of Zachary's film, has set up shop in the, in the early 20th century, factory-based mass production has transformed the American Midwest. Railroads are important, but so, of course, are cars. And people think of Henry Ford, obviously, and his automobiles, um, but what they don't often know is that Ford himself had been motivated by the industrialization of animals. And Ford's famous uh, automotive assembly lines for cars were themselves inspired by the slaughterhouses of the Midwest, the so-called vertical abattoirs in which animals were slaughtered. Indeed, for all the terror that cars have unleashed in the 20th century, um, Ford himself could see already in the 1920s uh, what kind of a destructive future animal agriculture might usher in. And so Henry Ford authored a pamphlet called The Cow Must Go, uh, which called for the elimination of cows. Um, and he was an early pioneer of industrial soy techniques. I mean, he's a very sort of complicated figure. Um, but thus, when we learn in the film, uh, which is a fact I didn't know, that Fortune magazine, to this day, still a real staple of American capitalist print culture, featured Swift & Co and featured industrial animal agriculture and their first issue, we can begin to see a series of connections. The railroad, the assembly line, the businessman's magazine, animal life, animal death is present for and participates in each. And so what explains this connection? Well, we can start with capital, um, the word in, in English, um, has its linguistic roots in Latin and other Romance languages in caput, or catapolis, uh, which is head, um, as in, you know, capital punishment, uh, give me your head. Um, but its use uh, mostly was to refer to a head of cattle, or uh, cows as a signifier of wealth. So the term capital itself has a kind of animal agriculture etymology to it. That's probably the most dramatic term of animal economy, uh, but there are others. Of course, stocks, as in you know, financial stocks, come from the stockyards. Brands were what was used to um, signify ownership of a particular uh, animal. The animal was branded. Horsepower, that's an easy one. Um, the um, American English uh, vernacular term for a dollar is a buck, uh, which refers to a buckskin, um, and so on. Um, so it would be perfect for this if, if film <laughs> itself was one such word, um, but it's not. But of course, gelatin is, and animal gelatin becomes photographic gelatin, and there's a trans transposition there that, as Zachary mentioned, um, Nicole Shukin makes much of in her book, um, animal capital. Um, one thing maybe to mention that Shukin does mention in her book is that 
Uh, the earliest motion pictures that were developed out of these remains of animals in the stockyards were in fact of the stockyards. So uh, some of the earliest uh, films, moving pictures, were of animals being slaughtered in these abattoirs. Um, the film from the animal is then used to capture the animal. Right, um, and here it's. I also just want to to notice, and and I think this this sort of gels with a part of Zachary's film, um, is that in addition to uh, the Chicago stockyards serving as a kind of nexus for um, a film history uh, and an economic history um, in terms of a certain commodity production, some of the most radical labor organizing in the United States um, in the 20th century also came out of the Chicago stockyards. I mean, you won't be surprised to learn that these were abhorrent uh, working conditions. Um, and in fact, one of the sort of uh, most famous uh, early 20th century um, revolutionary poems, um, one written by the African American poet Claude McKay, um, the poem is called If We Must Die. And its, its famous first line is, if we must die, let it not be like hogs. Um, so I think the, the image of the hog and the, and the hog death, um, which is which just so sort of omnipresent, a sort of haunting in this film, I think is really something to um, consider here. But also this, this seems like a rather older economy, what I've been discussing so far. Um, however, as the closing moments of the film, Zachary's film notes, it's really been 80 years or so since Bubbly Creek was actively bubbling. And um, as he also notes, um, the, the book by Alex Lanchette, uh, an anthropologist, um, Porkopolis, really brings us from the sort of history that his film recounts um, to the present of animal capital. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if Zachary's film, if Red Meat Republic, Animal Capital, if these look at 20th century animal capitalism, that which gave us the materials of film and photography, then we should ask how do we advance to the digital world where not only film production but animal slaughter are not so much mechanized um, as they are computerized. Uh, living in Boston, Massachusetts in 2018, Blanchett writes in his book, quote, I perceive traces of hog substance in my computer processor, on gelatin coated pages of my essays and photographs on my wall, and in my medicine cabinet. I cannot write this book. It is possible that I cannot type this sentence without touching traces of industrial pigs. As viewers now, today, to Zachary's piece uh, note, um, his film has a real stillness and slowness. And I think his decision to portray the vault as both a place of uh, decay and death still, even after the actors there um, are long gone, tells us something about the sort of importance of this word remains, um, which is in English is both a verb, to remain, as well as a noun. Uh, remains are a synonym for the bodily material after someone, whether human or animal, has died, one's remains. Um, so where does this leave us? What remains? Where does this leave us, the pigs, the workers, critics, viewers, filmmakers, today? For me, one of Marx's most dramatic lines is that, quote, capital is dead labor, which vampire-like lives only by sucking living labor, and lives the more, the more labor it sucks, end quote. Zachary's film, I think, asks us to understand that meat and capital are both dead. But that like everything capital kills, some part of it lingers. And so I want to close my remarks today with a kind of question, both to Zachary and Salome, um, but also for, for everyone. Um, and that is to sort of think about how the film leaves us in its final moments um, with both an animal past uh, that quite literally remains, uh, but also metaphysically remains, and then the, the issue of how we encounter that past in the present and what its future holds. Um, and I'm very interested for those who, who've seen the film um, in the, the dialogue uh, that Zachary has at the end of the film 
uh, where a man approaches him and sort of asks him what he's doing here, um, making this film or looking at this creek. Um, and for me, this is a sort of moment of the return of the repressed. Uh, but what returns is not a pig or money or a worker. Uh, but for me, really, what returns is the kind of infrastructure of American meat. And I do want to qualify that here, that this does seem distinctly American to me. Um, and so there's strange, there's some strange moments in the film where Zachary is telling this man uh, why this creek, oh, I guess it disappeared, but uh, why this creek uh, bubbled. And the man asks, you know, what was the cause of it? But his actual words are, what meat did to it? So as though meat had become a kind of actor, right? A sort of personification, uh, which is, I think, a really interesting parallel to the personification of capital that Marx often plays with. But for me, too, I read this man as the kind of echo of a white supremacy and a white masculinity that is so much a part of the American animal agriculture and meat discourse, and that its defenders really um, draw on. And so, you know, in the early moments of the, the pandemic in spring 2020, uh, Donald Trump ordered that slaughterhouses remain open in the Midwest, even though they're clearly spreaders of COVID. But he, he qualified those as essential industries. Um, and I think, I think that sort of asks us as viewers, as audience members, as critics, to think about how we will look back on this moment of animal capital and will Will firms like Blanchette describes now, where sort of 21st century animal agriculture firms ultimately appear like the cigarette industry or the fossil fuel industry? Um, sort of what is the haunting that we might get from our present in a way similar to the haunting that Zachary produces in this film for this animal past? So I'll just leave my remarks there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Zachary, and thank you, Lee Claire. That was amazing. Um, so, uh, and thank you, um, Impact and Saskia and Jin. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm going to um, talk in a more sort of micro way about the film. Um, it's a very rich and complex film. There's a lot to think about and to try to puzzle out. Um, I think the film invites one to puzzle things out and to try to think things through. And I take those long duration shots of the vault, of the vault and of Bubbly Creek as an indication of this open invitation. Why? Because the pacing of those of the visual material really gives one time to think through that voiceover commentary. OK, so I have three basic comments on three threads in this complex film. The first has to do with the observation in the film about the Fortune magazine article's preoccupation with the paradox of how destruction produces value. So as I understand it, the idea is that Swift's meatpacking production process, which begins with industrial scale animal slaughter, is a process of disassembling something that has already been assembled. So Swift does pay for raw materials, um, does not pay for raw materials, because the pigs are, in a sense, perfectly formed material, you will. So many representations of meat packing, of the meat packing industry, from the early films that Lee Claire mentioned, um, to George Franju's 1949 Blood of the Beast, to Frederick Wiseman's 1976 Meat, to Nikolaus Gerhalter's 2005 Art from Leather and Glue to Fully Formed Shoes, or how you get from color powder and hot wax to, to a fully formed crayon. They're films that show the production of the commodity from its raw material. Value is here still hidden, but there's something intuitive, right? First, I had the leather scraps. Now I have the shoe, which I really need. So there's something intuitive about the superior value of the shoe compared to the raw material from which it was formed. 
But in the case of the meatpacking industry, things are less intuitive. The swift process of production follows the opposite trajectory. Value in the technical sense comes from the disassembly, the destruction of the animal, the separation into parts. Um, the more contemporary filmmakers like Wiseman and um, Gerhalter, who applied the processual approach so familiar from the history of industrial and ethnographic filmmaking to meatpacking, they're using that processual syntax to expose the perversity and depravity of industrial slaughter. In a sense, they're also preoccupied with the paradox of how destruction produces value. So I read Zachary's film against that representational history and tradition and kind of common sense, now probably common sense approach to take. So that's kind of the first observation. The second um, is another thread of the film is about the dream and maybe, and the reality of an efficient profit maximizing cycle of production. So the film opens with Swift, or an executive, the founder, the, um, chastising his workers for waste that is released into Bubbly Creek. The point is that the production process is not efficient enough. As the film unfolds, we learn that their developments, progress, progress. The discovery of gelatin with all its uses was one of those, progress in quotes. Animal remains, or animal traces, if you will, after the production process could be made into gelatin, a very useful material. The animal's dust, or whatever is left over, gets incorporated into the feed that grows more pigs. The idea is that the production consumption production cycle is an unending cycle that produces value and which expresses itself in the form of money, like the actual money, the money that's stored in those bank vaults that we see. So the visual metaphor of the circle, the round bank vault, the 360 degree pan of the Chicago National Stockyard bank vault, the round reflected sun in, bubbly, in the bubbly creek water, these to my mind are visual metaphors for this cyclical unending process, a process where traces are reincorporated and disappear. Of course that disappearing trace can be usefully contrasted to the seeping waste that opens the film. So that's the second thread. The third, um, the third one unfolds right there in the middle of the film, almost exactly halfway through. And it's strange, it's interesting to me. It's the interlude in the film that gives the film its title. It's the thread about gelatin. So gelatin, we learn across the film, is many things. One, gelatin appears as a metaphor in Marx. We learn it's a metaphor for abstract labor. Two, gelatin is a material made from the remains of animals. It's more literal understanding. Three, gelatin is photography's condition of possibility. Four, gelatin, and this is a quote from um, a text in the film I'm quoting now, not a chemical substance, gelatin, not a chemical substance of definite composition and constitution, of properties independent of origin and preparation, but a material embodying a history, which from first to last affects its behavior. That's the quote, and it's from um, a photography monograph pictured in the film. So that's number four. Number five, we learn that gelatin is an irreplaceable medium the narrator tells us that Kodak prepares for all manner of eventualities by, and this is from the film's voiceover, stockpiling gelatin, the irreplaceable medium in which the photograph's light sensitive particles are suspended. But then comes an odd story. In Kodak's lab, a scientist discovers that gelatin works best when the animal has consumed mustard seeds. At this point, one thinks they know where this is going. The company will try to extend the control of the production process to the diet of the cow. The production process won't start with the fully formed animal, but with the feed that grows the animal. This is, to my mind, the um, Blanchette point. This would have been a perfect illustration of the point about gelatin being a, quote, imbo material embodying in history which affects its behavior. 
but that's not the direction that things go. Instead, we get a story about how the scientist patents a process for producing the mustard seed effect, let's say, in the laboratory, chemically. What then can be said about the material history of the laboratory-produced gelatin? Why am I laboring this point? Because the laboratory experiment prefigures something that must become clear, namely that it turned out that gelatin was an eminently replaceable medium. The registration of an image of the world ultimately did not require it. After all, most of the photographic images in this film and in most, of, most films and photographs we circulate today were made without gelatin, using a different technology, a digital technology. What seems irreplaceable in one historical moment turned out to be replaced in another historical moment. What am I trying to get at? For me, there's a tension between thread two, that unending cycle of production and consumption, which has an organic character, and thread three, the technological intervention, the laboratory-generated mustard seed effect. On the one hand, we have a film about hard-to-see traces, Right? The filming of the vault recuperates the trace of the reign of the meatpacking industry in Chicago. The unearthed 1940s fortune essay with its old photographs is a recovered archival trace of this period. The photographs of the bank vault taken by Bork White reference the trace of the crash of 1929. She says, the film tells us, history was pushing her face into the camera even though she was pushing the lens the other way. Um, there's a trace of the animal in Kodak gelatin. There's a trace of previously slaughtered pigs and cows in the next generation that feeds and grows from animal dust and parts. There's the trace of labor, the conceal congealed labor stored in saleable meat packing products. So we have a film about the traces of history, but it's a film that plays with or makes oblique reference in my reading to the dream of a facing history, or put differently, it references the dream of test tube gelatin, the dream of technical, technological solutions to organic problems. The Kodak scientist wishes to be freed from the cow, from the contingencies of life on Earth, of organic life. The scientist writer of the monograph on photography emphasizes that gelatin is, and this is quoted in the film, or the text can be seen, is not a chemical substance of definite composition and constitution, of properties independent of origin and preparation. Rather, this is the contrast, it bears a history. It, it is a material embodying a history. The Kodak scientist works to undermine that history. And the point of the story is that he succeeds. He patents his inventions. It's the realization of a dream, in a way, probably the same dream that has people looking for technological solutions to climate change, the same dream that Hannah Arendt was complaining about when she wrote of one reporter's reaction to that man-made satellite that circled the Earth for the first time in 1957. She wrote, the immediate reaction expressed on the spur of the moment was relief about the, about the first, quote, this was the reporter, step toward escape from man's imprisonment on Earth. OK, so summarizing. Gelatin in both senses, at a, as a metaphor for exploited labor and as animal remains, makes the photographic image possible, or the monstrous image possible. It's like its original sin. But the film also seems to suggest that the registration of the image is the trace that makes the recuperation of history possible. Think about the photographic, so the photographic image is the condition of possibility for historical reproduction, reconstruction. Think about Bork White and the photographs of bank interiors during the crash. Gelatin has a kind of double edge. And the, that ambivalence is there again in the story about the gelatin scientist's experiments, a capitalist modernity that can potentially free us and the animal from gelatin, a modernity that can replace it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the, I just need to check the time real quick to see where. 
we're supposed to end at 4.15, is that right, or 4.30, yeah? 4.30, 430 okay. Um, yeah, so we have a few minutes and then we can just, uh, one thing I just wanted to quickly point out is that that quote about the history, uh, that it's a medium embodying a history, or not that it's a medium embodying a history, but a uh, substance embodying a history, for the, it is that, it's, it's the guy who does the patent that wrote that history of it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's, it is kind of like a, and when he describes it, he, it is like as a, uh, a kind of, um, not a virtue, but like a shortcoming. Like, you know, as a scientist, this is frustrating that this, that we haven't like been able to isolate the technical, um, or, you know, this singular substance. Um, so it's attention in his own discourse yeah yeah it's kind of like I mean I felt like it was like him being uh, well okay so the thing about that whole story that was very um, confusing for me was that I first encountered it in Shukin's book Animal Capital and there the way she describes it it's not explicit but it's the way she sets it up it is exactly like that's the step that they would then make is get this herd of cattle and that Kodak would start raising its own cattle and and there is a mythology of that within these whole there's uh, um, a uh, a filmmaker who is working at the um, film Werk plots in Rotterdam that I spoke with a lot around she gave me all kinds of information about and showed how to make your own uh, film emulsions and um, they're doing that down there th their own uh, film emulsions and and so some some of the lore around this, like the founders of the the photochemistry, um, a herd that Kodak owned a herd of cattle is part of that lore. It's very, and I don't know, I couldn't find anything that would confirm that. Um, but but there is this kind of notion that that is out there that uh, that that yeah, they were kind of in control of the whole. Process and that's what initially attracted me to it. It was like, this. Why is this industry exemplary? Um, in part, it's because it actually kind of sets the program for what, like, the film industry sets the program for the meatpacking industry. That that kind of verticalization wouldn't Vertical exist. Exactly. Yeah, vertical integration. Yeah, it wouldn't happen until uh, much later in the 20th century. So it seemed like, oh, so they actually set the model, which I thought was great. That's interesting. And, but then it turned out that it maybe wasn't really like that, that Kodak never actually, and that instead they have this, uh, this program for, um, being able to secure sources throughout the entire globe in case of various crises and whatever that they would always need. So the, the emphasis on the irreplaceability of gelatin becomes really clear when it's like that's the thing they need to secure, not silver, which you would think is like the most valuable and all of this, but gelatin, which somehow is like the, their vulnerability in the... Um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with all that, but, uh, but it just reminded me of this... Uh, when you were quoting him, uh, that that yeah, it's I think it is kind of important that it's that it's he that this scientist sees this as a lack that this substance is not like a purely scientific thing or a purely you know organic object or something you know that it has this kind of um, thing to eliminate. Like he sees it as setting the target. How do we get rid of that historical aspect of it? How do we make it pure? It's. What's interesting to me is that is the inclusion of it and the place that you include it in the film, like almost right in the middle. Mm. And then the detail about the patents. So it's not merely the kind of dream of the escape from the history of the animal. It's there's some suggest you know, there's some suggestion of a kind of success in the production of a mu the mustard seed effect and gelatin without controlling yeah. the animal. Yeah. So, but it's that it's the inclusion of that story that push it that creates a to my mind like what I love a kind of tension or a kind of question or a kind of pushes in a slightly different direction. Mm. Yeah, and I don't it's know funny. If you see that? I yeah, 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 you. yeah. And I think like for me that was what I got out of the Blanchette description of the 
um, not the verticalization, but the, this thing where he describes at one point. Um, the, horse, this, the horses? Well, I'm thinking of this like the walking of the pods. It's, I think it's in the second chapter. I don't remember which chapter, but anyway, it's the chapter where he's describing how the, um, it, this is all production side of pigs, so it's not slaughter. Uh, but that um, that there is this uh, this real hierarchy of sites within it, and that there's a certain elite group of managers who can go to each site in the so like you know where they raise the the, the male pigs, and uh, where they re raise the breeding uh, sows, and um, and you can't uh, nobody can who has been in one site can go to another site except for this elite group. And that group kind of follows the the trajectory of the sperm to the to the the female cow to or uh, sow to to the pig, um, you know, and then on down. And what they're looking for is any kind of like um, anomalies or whatever that emerge in this whole thing. And it's it's basically he describes it. I don't remember what the exact words are that he uses, but it's very clear that it's like about eliminating any kind of transformation between, uh, like to not allow history to get into that, to not allow, like the temporal loop is complete in this, in this circuit, you know, like there, there, there should be no um, exterior to this pig reproduction cycle. You want to get to the perfect object and then reproduce. So it's like in the animal itself, there is a removal of what we think of as animal. Okay, so I think Right, so what you read as the Blanchette moment, I read in the exact opposite way. Because for me, that's the eff that moment, like I remember this moment from Blanchette, that's the effort to control totally conditions of animal life. Mm. But what the scientist, what Shepard wants to do is be free of that, like not mess around with that kind of level of control. That would be like feeding the cow's mustard seed. What he wants is to, like the test tube, mm. he wants to be entirely free because control is like a, it's an, you know, it's a, it's a losing battle. You mm. can't control, <laughs> I mean, and that's, the, that's what we learn in a way from Blanchette, that the craziness of that effort to prevent any contamination it's, it reads so insane. It reads like science fiction because it seems somehow impossible that the world history will seep in. Mm. But Shepard's test tube gelatin is like the, being free from that game, yeah. like being out of that game mm. or something. Yeah. That's my reading. Yeah, yeah, no, and that makes sense because it is really about being able to use any kind of remains. Like there's almost this dream too that you could use any animal. Like if we just, you know, you could boil the, the bones and the skin of whatever and put in this little magic digestive substance that he developed. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, maybe we can, or did you, do you have anything that you wanna, no. We can see if there's something, I have like a, a how do we do that to switch to the audience? Uh, question mode? I know there's like some kind of a tossable mic. Oh, that's your famous ball. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, three. Really amazing. And I, I very much hope that most of you have seen the exhibition and the film. Um, but in a way, you also made it very um, tangible and explained it into depth. Maybe a very banal question, but um, as you already mentioned, now we moved on to a different carrier of um, audiovisual information from the um, film strip to the digital data. So with all this gelatine, st gel gelatine still being produced and probably um, meat production had increased tremendously over the last decades as well, or since the digital revolution. Where does it all go now? Or was it just, let's say, in relation to the international production of gelatine, that which went on the film strip was maybe a fraction of it? So, it, 
was substantial what went to the film and, and actually the there's um without getting too into the details uh kodak set up their own gelatin manufacturing plant um or they bought out some old one in the in the 20s i think um and in i think it was 2013 or 2011 anyway somewhere around then they sold it because they weren't they didn't need it anymore they weren't making it but they, when they sold it and they sold it to a dutch food conglomerate actually vion um a subsidiary of them in france Rousselot, who just makes gelatin and most of it goes into pharmaceuticals i think actually now and kodak had already gotten into pharmaceuticals before they sold that off i think that was part of how they dealt with their excess of gelatin and they were already yeah, it's pharmaceuticals, and but it is like it's really like as the the passage that uh, Lee Claire quoted from uh, Blanchette about you know I can't even you know type the sentence without touching the remains of pigs. It's I think gelatin is is one of it's the 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 most ubiquitous of the animal substances that that you know comes at. and it's it's interesting because it's also maybe the most invisible. Uh, but it's also really tactile. And that was something in the research around like why and talking with Esther Urlis in, uh, at the film uh what she made really clear was that like, you know, the thing, the reason why gelatin is irreplaceable, and she had worked with a, with a filmmaker in, um, from Austria who was interested in trying to uh, develop a vegan uh, uh, film emulsion which turned out to be way worse environmentally because it was some kind of a plastic, you know, thing or it was some kind of fossil fuel based thing that you ended up with there, oil based petroleum. Um, and so they were working on something else. I forget what, but anyway, it's not so important. Uh, so, but the reason why that didn't work as well, even when they had found a replacement is because gelatin has this, this property that's, it's kind of mimetic with skin, which feels really strange because it comes from the skin of, I mean, the ideal photographic, they take it from bones and all kinds of stuff, but it's really uh, the best stuff, at least this shepherd would write in his uh, 23 book, was from the hides of cattle. And, uh, you know, so gelatin, it opens and closes when you change the temperature of the water that you submerge it in. Um, so when you have these light sensitive particles sitting in that uh, and you change the temperature of the water, you can then uh, you know, add developer uh, into the water uh, or, you know, you warm it or whatever and that developer then can access the light sensitive particle, it can be affected by it, then you cool it again and it can't access it anymore. So you can control this thing through the, through this kind of, you know, uh, reconstructed skin that is the emulsion. Uh, so there, there's some like gelatin, it has, that is such, it's this kind of tangibility, tactility that is like disturbing, you know, it's like if you've ever, uh, if you've ever eaten tongue before, you know, and that, that, that like texture that comes, that crosses your tongue, it's very disturbing. It's, uh, it's kind of a like, yeah, there's, there's something like, it's almost like a, like a, interfere like a feedback or something like that it's it's uh, it's a strange uh thing so it has this there's something about it it's tactility that i think is really interesting aesthetically because it's not it's it's kind of neutral visually it has this kind of way of subtracting itself visually but uh but then it has this really overly articulated um uh tactility in in terms of touch and yeah Yeah, thank you for really engaging set of talks and uh, fascinating project. I'm wondering if we could think about this case uh, also of gelatin as a prehistory of, let's call it somehow residual media and the entanglement of our current uh, electronic and digital devices and infrastructures where this is, you know, maybe this is only possible, this research, or the, because of the awareness of the extractivism that we are dependent on and the entanglement of these uh, digital infrastructures uh, with similar processes, but which are much more complex. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a question, but I'm just wondering, you know, like, how we could see this and learn from this 
in order to unpack some of the dependencies of, of our current, <laughs> even though gelatin is still, of course, uh, current, but maybe undead in some way or residual. Uh, and yeah, you, do you have thoughts? Have you discussed these kind of aspects in your project? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, I think this is part of the like exemplary character. Actually, the title of this, this piece I was thinking initially was going to be an exemplary industry and it's irreducible medium, but it just became too unwieldy and kind of pretentious or something. So I decided to get rid of the exemplary and put the, um, but there's, there's something about the, the, yeah, the way that, that the, this entanglement, as you describe it, um, is is revealed very clearly in this kind of old, seem you know, older kind of technology uh, substance um, that is maybe more difficult to parse, perhaps in digital kind of networks and and that whole infrastructure. Um, but I think, especially if you think of animal, I mean, I don't the extent to which animal remains that was that was kind of an eye opener the blanchette book in this case and there's then you i found a lot of other places that uh and and people who are working on this that or who you know yeah write about it anyway the this sort of ubiquity of these substances and all kinds of things which is a very present thing even though it is a kind of remains but there's something also about the remains of animals and the remains of organic material you know that go into fossil fuels so it's like a shorter history and it's a, like a more recent kind of thing in a way too so it's very i think it's like it's not like this thing that we're moving out of animal remains and into kind of petroleum fossil fuel based stuff it's kind of, it's more like this oscillation between them and they kind of shed a bit of light on each other somehow yeah that's why i was going to say i was going to answer very similarly, but maybe with a little bit of a different vocabulary. But I was going to, um, that's where my mind went to, to your question, was the different durée, the different durations of these different materials and their sort of absorption um, into human techne, technology. And I was also, I was thinking of, um, of, of fossil, of fossil fuels and um, of, uh, you know, Andreas Malm's um, Fossil Capital book, I don't know if you know that, um, and also uh, Timothy Mitchell's Carbon Democracy um, book, but sort of, um, I like the way that, uh, that you phrased it, Zachary, that there's, there's something very sort of, um, on the one hand, both very antiquated about the gelatin in its employ in photographic operations and then very avant-garde about it in relationship to millions if not billions of years of fossil fuels that need to sediment to be extracted in a similarly useful way although the scale is you know obviously quite different um, but i thought that was interesting the the idea to develop a vegan gelatin you go to petroleum they, they, were, they were trying to do agar agar or some, okay. they, but it was very difficult, and she's still working on it, I think, maybe or something. But yeah, petroleum was the first. Hello, thank you very much for that like conference. It was quite interesting, and it evoked me like quite of. Like you evoke quite a lot of subjects, uh, like the environment, the infrastructure, the um, techniques, like the technologies are involved, and also the way of production and control. But I feel like all of this are often relate to patents. Actually, like the is it this patents? Yeah, yeah, patents, pa patents, pat patents. Like, but what is given by the government for a period of time of 20 years, for example, in Europe and in other countries, it can be longer. And my question is, like, you evoked also history most of the time that it's actually hard to replace or it's irreplaceable through history. But is it patents are actually slowing down the? futuristic like how to to move on and to have new technologies to pass to gelatin to have something more 
Yeah, maybe eco-friendly of our days, but maybe there is already patents that are blocked for a certain amount of years, so we're blocked into this. I don't know if you understand my question somehow. But yeah, if it's... I, do, I think I do understand the question, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, do you either oh. know? No? No. Oh. Okay. Yeah, but I think that there is, it, in this case, I don't think it's like intellectual property rights that have meant that um, that gelatin is unsurpassable or irreplaceable. Like, I don't think that there's, that it was like Kodak or the film companies that were trying to foreclose, although they vary, like all, there's a whole series of, like these, they filed so many patents for all kinds of stuff they never did. But, uh, and probably a lot of that was like this kind of precluding competition and, you know, to make sure that nobody else did it, like when you buy out these, you know, typical like monopoly capitalism stuff, because they were, there weren't so many of these film producers. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's, I, yeah, that's all, that's what I'll say on that. I don't know if that gets to a little bit of what you're. Um, just Thank because you. it's next door to me, I'll just ask a question. Well, it's more a comment than anything else. I just have this vision of Zachary um, being, at, um, being at that place, uh, Bubbly Creek, and, and that you actually, here in this room, we actually have a bit of it here because it's just uh, integrated into your body, those uh, molecules coming out of the, <laughs> those gases, uh, methane, and that you've just, uh, it's been, uh, it's become part of you even. By breathing it, yeah, the molecules, and they've uh, become um, something or other in your body, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think here we, we have a lot more of it from uh, the... No, but it's just a bit, a bit of bubbly creek that it's actually yeah. come here with you. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you've eaten a lot of cheesecake, you've probably eaten a lot of it as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, sorry, before the, the next question, I, I hope this doesn't sidetrack us, but I, I have to s say it, the polemicist in me, um, and that is that I, I, I don't know if this is a reading against the grain, but I think what's interesting, like what is most interesting to me is a kind of ambivalence, but what I'm not hearing in the room is the acknowledgement of the ambivalence. So when I see like that final image of the projector and the film strip running out, like I think, I mean, that's a kind of image of a kind of nostalgia. When you cite Bork White talking about how, you know, there she is filming the bank <coughs> interiors on the you know, as the crash is unfolding and these, you know, bank workers are passing in front of her and she doesn't know where the story is and, you know, she could have registered it. To me, this, like, I can't get over the sense that this is a kind of, like, love of the photographic image, its capacity to register the world, and it's on that foundation that you kind of build this, that you give us its traces. So like when we say that gelatin is, every, is everywhere, it's in everything, yes, but if we don't acknowledge that it's in everything and in everywhere and in many of the useful things that we love and enjoy and need, we're, we're kind of lost. So what I love about the film is that there's like a tension. You have both, you have like an acknowledgement of what gelatin is this monstrous, you know, that gelatin makes possible this monstrous image, but at the same time there's a kind of nostalgia, there's a kind of loss for that, you know, analog, that technology. And, and so, I mean, I have to think like when we talk about this irreplaceable medium, like, in fact, registering an image of the world is possible without gelatin, like medium, you know. So in one sense, like, I want to say, well, it's, yes, it's very replaceable. But then I think, like, if you love film and the image that film produces, and I have to think about that film loop that you use, you know, then I think, well, it's irreplaceable, or that kind of quality of image is irreplaceable, and there's a kind of 
you know, mix, there's a kind of loss and a kind of recognition of a moral and an ethical problem. And it's that space, I think, that is most, that is like fraught and, you know, and that's where you go. And I think that for me is where it's at, that fraught space. So I don't know if that's a reading against the grain, but, or, you know, a total misreading. <laughs> I like that reading. <laughs> but I think there is this thing about the shift of the irreplaceability, or like where gelatin goes. Like, yes, you can have a, a we can, we have technologies that don't require gelatin at all to register an image of the world, but probably something in that image is going to have gelatin in it. Right. But the possibility of overcoming, or of, you know, if at one historical moment, the condition of possibility for that photographic image requires gelatin. You want that photographic image, you need that gelatin. You know, at some, if at some historical moment it, be, it becomes the case that that's not no longer required. And so in this like particular instance, it's not, which is not to say gelatin is not everywhere, but as a kind of possibility of the technological overcoming of something that seemed impossible. Like it has that you know, it's like the micro case. And I think it's the micro case that animates like all these, you know, environmental <laughs> scientists who are like, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna solve climate change technologically, you know. Yeah. Shall I? <laughs> okay. So, um, I, I think I changed my question at least three times <laughs> while listening to all this. But uh, so, um, okay, uh, uh, how it, so what you're describing, um, well, all, all three speakers in this layered analysis and the film itself is a um, sort of a, yeah, historical method which actually next to the facts and the histories and the entanglements describes something like a total capture, total technological capture. And there, the, the key word is actually feedback, a system that feeds into itself into some sort of a figure of a total efficiency that boils down to something which is transparent and ultra flexible. So that's very interesting. And that's the human labor uh, and the wealth and human labor quote from Marx. That's, that's one interesting figure of, of labor. And I'm thinking, I was also thinking, like many other, um, uh, yeah, here in this room. Uh, so now we are no longer using, uh, yeah, celluloid and gelatin, but variety of digital technologies for another capture, which extract different other things like uh, precious uh, minerals and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, what is the figure of labor that would be, <laughs> you know, following from that? Are we caught into this transparent, flexible gelatinous or in something else? And I'm thinking of like the ecological um, uh, impact of uh, ultra computing and all the blockchain technologies and the currencies is, ju is just the temperature output to the environment also streaming and so on. So there is another technological loop. And one very bizarre historical note. So what is the, the digital figure of labor? Or what, we, what is, you know, like if we can imagine it. So, uh, Michael Baxendal, um, and this is like a history, uh, I cannot quote the book, like so, Renaissance Italy, painting, uh, material, and the emergence of actually the definition of the individual artist. First, in contracts, only gold and blue are registered, no, no names. <laughs> only then later, <laughs> with a, a description of, uh, you know, with the, with the idea of the deadline, actually, there is an indication of who should do it. So names and individual authors. So material to a definition of a, some kind of producer. So that's a, maybe a very distant analogy. But so from the gelatinous labor and wealth to the digital, and what would, would it be? Yeah, I think that Maybe you want to say something too, but can I say something quick first? <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's an interesting question to to ask what, and it's also, yeah, to, to kind of get back to this thing that, of course, while we were talking about gelatin as this literal material, um, 
the usage of it by Marx as a figure for the character of labor in capitalist societies. Um, I mean, this ultimately is like the irreplaceable medium will be that labor. Um, and, and yeah, it's a, I think it's, a, I don't know that, that we actually need a digital figure for it, but it's an interesting question. It's, but I would think that, I, well, okay, I think maybe this figure of gelatin, maybe gelatin is outmoded quicker than its uh, metaphorical value in the Marx, exp you know what I mean? Like that maybe it actually still works as a figure for labor certain, I mean, if we think of, and it's also that question of like deindustrialization, um, that it's certainly a figure for, for certain types of labor, for a lot of labor that's still um, undertaken. Um, but yeah, the necessity for other figures, for other sorts of labor, it's, I mean, it's not the only form that human labor takes under capitalism, I would say. Yeah, I think what I would say is um, is that maybe what's what's sort of powerful about it, in the sense that Zachary is um, referen making reference to the way that Marx uses it, um, is that it can function as um, metonymy and metaphor, right? Sort of a, a stand in for and a part of. Um, and I, I guess I, it's not an answer to your question, I don't think. I'm not sure I can answer it. But I would, I would hope that if people did want to try to answer it and nominate something that it, to, to stand in for that, for a figure of, of the digital nomad or the digital worker or what have you, um, that, you know, I think one of the things that's so powerful about the Marxist analysis is Marx's and Mark, good Marxist um, is the... The, the twin capture of metonymy and metaphor through a sort of always dual scheme of abstract and concrete, right? Um, so let's hope if there's a new figure it, that it does emerge, it does have that. What? We can, we can talk at the bar. <laughs> I, and I just wanted, it reminded me of one thing that I especially wanted to bring up in relation to your uh, work, Leclerc, and that is that that I think one of the things that's powerful about the gelatin figure for labor is also that it brings up this relationship of human and animal. Because there you have there, it's very clear that like I mean, it's a situation in which both where where human and animal are rendered the same substance, um, and that's what capital puts to work. So it's kind of like, it is this kind of figure for the animalization of labor also. Um, like, and it's, that's the material that's so like the gelatin holds the, the you know, light sensitive particles of photographic image together, that animal substance, but it also holds this, you know, uh, it's, it's the medium in which labor is, uh, you know, existing in, uh, in capitalist production. <laughs> that one's clear. Thank you. Thank everyone. Thank you.